last one to uh, present. I'm going to ask Chris the first question. Um, Chris, in your in your opinion, as a foreign lawyer, yeah, do you think that there's too much state intervention into sort of the freedom of contract, into construction contracts, in terms of how prescriptive? Well, in terms of how prescriptive Decree Thirty Seven can be, defining quantities, prices, rates, as opposed to the contract between the parties themselves. Well, do you have a, an opinion about that? About the, uh, if you think that the Decree 37 and associated laws are too prescriptive in terms of the contract between the parties. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, that, that, that's, a, the, that's a good question, but the uh, very difficult question at the end. <laughs> yeah, uh, broad topic. Uh, but the, yeah, in general, the, yeah, it's, it's more prescriptive uh, than the other uh, countries' laws and the also uh, in the other cases like, you know, Felix. But the, um, but the, I mean, it's a law, so the, you know, the uh, everybody uh, doing business or the working in Vietnam, you know, they, they have to follow it and the, they, at least they have to refer to it and they consider those uh, situations, the, um, the accompanied by the, uh, the degree 37 and, the, uh, and the long construction and the, but I mean, even, you know, assuming, uh, those provisions, you know, there can be some other, you know, uh, the creative way to, you know, make the, their, you know, the contract provisions to make it, uh, to make it working more effectively um, right um, so the it is the I, I think you know that that, that that that's a good opportunity for you know lawyers to get involved and the, you know the suggest some you know create uh, the very uh, creative uh, the proposals to you know to right. circumvent those difficulties sure because what what I've been hearing um this morning and also now uh -huh. Is that you know normally for 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 us you know um, the matter of variations and changes is just a, a simple business as usual matter of contract administration. There shouldn't you know in my experience you know typically you just administer the contract instead of uh, amending terms and conditions and so on you know or coming up with a new. But anyway, that is just obviously this 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 afternoon is all about. You know foreign perspectives on on Vietnamese practice, and I think I think we all agree that that's probably one of the observations that we have. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Obviously, at the end of the day, I think you know Vietnamese law, you know the civil code, the law on construction. Mm -hmm. Let's just say it has a much higher priority than a contract mm -hmm. between two private individuals. Mm -hmm. So you have to apply it mm -hmm. whether you like it or not. So does that resolve the conflict? You know, you know, you know, law one, contract zero. Yeah. So you just apply the law, and that's it. I don't know. I'm just putting it out there. It's a, with an argument. Okay. Well, um, let's see. Uh, interesting. Ah, Julian, it's your turn. And, and then I will uh, open up to the floor right. okay. after Christoph. Um, the concept that you mentioned in your presentation about the, uh, let's just say, creative um, items that uh, that were that, that, such as the high level. Uh, what do you call high-level works Sponsors. orders that really didn't have any description or definition in the contract? No. Um, and in, in terms of you know, does that mean it creates obligations or it doesn't create obligations? I mean, what's the effect? So obviously yes. So okay, thank you for your question. Uh, both the contract changes and the uh, HLW, so high-level work orders. Uh, were clearly not defined in the contracts. Otherwise, uh, uh, we would just have followed the contracts. And the point, I mean, the main uh, purpose of my experience sharing moment with you guys was really to focus on how at the working level, people tend to deviate from what has been agreed. And you have to keep in mind that what's been agreed has been agreed for reasons not just paying a lot of money to external councils, but actually to have a contract that is protecting the interest of the company that you're working for. So 
going back to your question, no, they were not defined. But yes, to some extent, they were binding because that it's not just once that's been we they have created those concepts that they have used as a precedent, and then by the action of issuing those documents called HLWO or CC, they have created a form of an amendment to the contract. You a clear deviation of the contract. So I can hear already uh, some push like Julian, there cannot be an amendment. It has not been uh, officially signed, but yeah, yeah, I agree. But still, in the practice, and that's what I want to emphasize as an in-house lawyer, in the practice, we have clearly deviated from what was agreed. And yeah. uh, just to conclude on that, I was sure that would be your turn then. Uh, <laughs> Don't get me wrong, uh, I, I use this example in Vietnam because we are in Vietnam and that was part of today's discussion. Um, this is not something that is that exists only in Vietnam. This is something I've encountered in the last 10 countries that I've been working uh, in, uh, public sectors, private sectors, from the contractor, from the uh, owners, it's something that seems to be really quite usual in the construction industry and in the energy industry. So again, what I would like to see to avoid uh, handling a multi-million US dollar arbitration at the end of the contract is to have the lawyers involved, not only at the negotiation of the contract, but as well when we implement the contract. I'm not saying that it's up to the lawyers to uh, uh, handle all the variation, but at least they should be involved to make sure that the contract has been complied properly. Right, uh, Julian, thank you very much. That's uh, pretty much uh, all clear. So just a uh, last question from me, then I'll open up to the audience here. Christoph, the uh, unilateral imposition of contracts changes, uh, it simply can't happen to the terms and conditions where you were describing in your presentation about, you know, the changes must be agreed between the parties, but sometimes scope and cost is not agreed from the outset. There's vague instructions that could be open to interpretation. But in FIDIC, of course, typically, the contractor must proceed without delay, and he can't delay because he's waiting for an instruction. So how does sort of the payment situation um, get resolved? If, you know, I've got a vague instruction, not sure, but I can't stop and wait for it. So quantum merit, I mean, how, how's, the, how's the poor guy paid? Um, to, to be honest, there is uh, many disputes in Vietnam about this uh, this issue, and usually the international contractor, because my clients are international contractors, so they carry on working, doing variation, and it's more or less then because dispute boards or arbitrations of the matter. Because uh, as I said previously, um, even if you want, you try to to negotiate to, to find an agreement. Sometimes it takes um, for one of my clients, it, it took one month, one year and a half to sign an agreement. So, uh, I mean, the agreement is not the only solution because otherwise your your construction project will stop. Uh, if your construction project stop, you have to maintain the equipment. It entails many, many uh, other issues. Uh, and so um, uh, I heard someone um, uh, this morning saying that, okay, we do construction, with, but we have to keep in, keep in mind we are in Vietnam. And from my experience, uh, and I will uh, stick to the contract, as Julian says, if you don't find an agreement, try to find another way, go to dispute board or arbitration. And uh, maybe it may be a, a way to, at final stage, to change the law and uh, to try to convince that the law has to be changed. Right. Yep. That's, uh, that's pretty much... Uh... Wraps it up, I think. Yeah, understood. Okay, so can I open up the uh, questions to the audience here? Now uh, we have a first hand here, gentleman. Uh, who's uh, who's carrying the microphone? Ah, yes, gentleman uh, sitting over here. Ah, this this one here. Yeah, there we go. Hello. Oh, good. Uh, I was going to ask a question of uh, Christoph. Uh, Christoph, there yeah. we are. Thank you. Uh, I I happen to uh, uh, be an attorney for the Los Angeles, California Metro. And so we probably have shared some similar experiences. 
So I was very interested in everything you had to say. Uh, how, what have been the dispute resolution mechanisms that, uh, that have been used on the Saigon Metro to handle disputes about variations uh, or other matters? Okay. Um, so without disclosing any to confidential information, this metro line is uh, the Saigon right. So the, the one which is financed by JK. Um, they are at the stage of the final payment uh, because I was for a subcontractor. Uh, we advise a subcontractor. And I have to say that uh, international contractors are really, really reluctant to introduce any disputes uh, because we know that in Vietnam, uh, if you introduce a dispute, you have to first to go to the dispute board, right? And then to arbitration. And uh, this procedure is delay and delay and delay because uh, most of the contract I have worked on, FedEx contract, the dispute board has not been appointed. So I have to say that, yes, uh, it should have, I think it's, as I recall, eight days after the, 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 the commencement date, something like that. Ten, 10 years in, there's still no dispute board. <laughs> Thank you. So um, I have no clear answer because we are still at the stage of what will we do? <laughs> because the client don't want, doesn't want to, to go to, uh, uh, to, uh, to arbitration because he has to go to dispute board, but uh, the other party would do whatever it can to delay and postpone all the procedure. So my experience is that you have to try to negotiate uh, but it takes a lot, a lot of time. And let's say that we don't have the same way to negotiate. I mean, when Western and, 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 and Vietnamese. So um, I have I have them the solution. Maybe next year. <laughs> Maybe, I hope so. Right, uh, any other questions from the audience? This gentleman uh, sitting here. Who would you like to ask? Yeah, okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, I think... Uh... Maybe thanks for your information. I have a lot of uh, experience and I would like to ask a speaker about, um, a speaker, maybe I forgot your name, but um, maybe he talked a lot about the Gosh Oil and Gosh project. Is it so huge and complex? I would like to uh, ask you that um, in this project, there are any kinds of disputes or arguments relating the change and variations. Thank you. Right, I think that's one for you, uh, Julian, because it sounded like oil and gas. Yeah. Yes, so your question, if I may reformulate it, is is there any claim at the moment in disputes about variations, is it? Yes. Okay, thank you um, for that. Um, <laughs> I have the answer, obviously. My concern about giving you the answer is, am I going to breach my confidentiality duty or not? Uh, but I believe there's no secret on that project that there is a massive arbitration, uh, including this. Including this, yes. Uh, I can't uh, give you more details about the strategy or which point had been raised properly. Uh, but yes, when I was, I don't know if you remember, I said potentially could lead to multi million US dollar claims. Uh, I cannot provide the figures, that's just a range again. Uh, but yes, of course, because once you have this kind of practice uh, where you have your contractor that is implementing uh, variations, because those are variations, they are nothing else than variations. Variations after variations after variations, trusting the fact that we work now, and then we will be paid later, and then there will be an impact, if there is an impact on the program, we will be entitled to extension of time. And then suddenly, once everything is done, the employer is saying, well, um, this one, okay, but this one actually, as Christoph said, that was not a proper request. That was more a wish than a variation. This one, we never agreed. This one, your uh, figures are totally uh, unreasonable. Uh, this one, you are saying that you need four months. We believe that in two weeks that could have been done. Therefore, you owe me liquidity damages. Uh, so 
obviously by not following the contract, by being too creative. And again, you can be creative. You can just say, okay, the variation clause as it is, is not working. Uh, we need to do something about it. Come, talk to your uh, legal department, raise it. Sometimes we listen. Uh, so what we would, could have done was be like, okay, then amend the contract. Let's make what you want something real. So at the end, we, number one, management will have a proper control on the alternative. And number two, you're not spending your time, your energy and your money on the claim on which one is a proper variation and which one is not. So, yeah. Yeah, okay, I got it. Thank you so much. Right, thank you for your question. Thank you, Julian, for the answer. Um, more questions out there. Right, gentleman sitting over there, just there. There we go. Who would you like to ask? Uh, I have a question from uh, Mr. Kim, but well, I guess any of the panelists could, uh, if they so can answer it, and I would like, appreciate it. Uh, from Mr. Kim's slide, uh, he mentioned that it is getting more difficult to get paid in part due to that there is no parallel provision for variation in the Vietnamese construction law. I am very curious because as I understand, well, in con contract, we we'll have variation clauses in most standard form contract. So I wonder if there is a reluctance or some kind of a tendency from the employer not to agree on variation because simply because there is no provision under the law or perhaps uh, in well, arbitration or litigation, something sometimes the various variations are being challenged because there is simply no governing law under the construction law. So I was very curious. Uh, okay, the, let me, the, because I, I, I didn't have enough time to the, explain the in detail about the uh, those topics the I just you know just briefly mentioned on uh, during presentation but it, yeah let me uh, take this chance to explain more in detail uh, so the no the I'm not talking about the uh, some you know some of the big construction project you know those contract the full uh, contract for the big uh, construction project they ox the you know the incorporate the feeding or the NEC are uh, most repeated. Uh, so the, you know the, the variation variation the uh, clauses are uh, incorporated uh, into the contract. But the uh, except for you know those big project uh, construct project, the uh, they just you know don't have the uh, the provisions on variation in the construction contract. And also the because the Vietnamese laws doesn't uh, require any uh, provisions on variation. They, the, those other, you know, the except for uh, big construction project, those uh, the uh, construction contract doesn't have the uh, provisions on variation. Then it happens, you know, the it has to be amended. Otherwise, the uh, the once you go to the uh, uh, go to the court or the VIA, VIA, then you know they ask for the uh, the some something in writing. Otherwise, you know, they they tend to not to accept those evidence. <laughs> to uh, approve or some you know additional fee uh, for the uh, the change in the works. So the, the, that's the uh, that, that's the situation for the uh, the most of the construction contract. I mean the in terms of the the, the, the construction investment you know, amount, uh, the big con big construction project, they you know the uh, the uh... right and Chris uh, thank you very much for the answer. Um... Does that answer your question? I mean, uh, I think I think the answer is yes. I mean, we, uh, we've established that Vietnamese law does have, actually have a lot of uh, provision for uh, variations, you know, legally. So. Yes, thank you. Right. Okay, more questions. Ah, gentleman over there. Oh, over here. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a very interesting uh, conference uh, today. Um, my question just on Vietnam and construction of Vietnam, but I would like your input on other countries. I've been in Vietnam for many years and uh, what was said today by uh, you, by Julian, Christophe, and by uh, Christopher, uh, is something which is not new in Vietnam. I just would like to know if in the other countries, 
maybe Julien, you have any expertise in other countries, or Christopher or Chris, if you have any expertise in other countries, he did the same. And, and coming back to Vietnam, do you see any improvement from the Ministry of Construction on, um, on those mega big projects? And many of them are financed actually by ADB or World Bank or sometimes some from the private sector bank, uh, the European bank. So what is your, your view on, on Vietnam? Is it going to be improved? And within ASEAN countries, is it the same as in Vietnam? Thank you. Right, thank you for your question. Uh, any volunteers? In terms of experience, international experience, comparatively with uh, Vietnam and the system in Vietnam, uh, in terms of construction contracts and variations, I, I suppose, uh, and also the attitude of the Ministry of Construction, yeah? Um, if that's uh, towards towards these issues. So, again, thank you, Nicola. Uh, my view, I think, in-house, which is obviously different than from a professional, from an external uh, law firm, uh, is that in terms of practice, I'm going back to the term because that's important. You have the legislation, but you have what you do with it. There's not, I haven't seen any significant differences. Where I've seen significant differences or similarities uh, is with whom you are dealing. In my project, uh, the local uh, MC uh, member was Petro Vietnam. Petro Vietnam, uh, it's a public entity. If not, it's almost like one. Um, if you have been working in Qatar, I've been working in Kuwait, the mentality is about the same in terms of I paid, I don't have, I'm limited with my budget. This is the budget that I have for that project. I've invested all my budget on that project, but I want it differently. So where I'm going back to what Chris uh, was saying earlier is um, I've seen, especially with public entities, that endeavor to obtain things without paying for it because not that because they want to abuse the system it's just that the allocated budget is not probably as big as for the private sectors so the thing is they will always try to say i wish you do like this or i would prefer you do like this but then if you don't follow the preferences then you will receive several emails saying this is not what i asked for so if it is not what you ask for, and if you re if you want me to be bound by your request, then according to the contract, it's a variation. The problem is they will never agree on this because they know that additional costs will have to be paid. So that that's where I've seen some similarities or differences. So it's not really about Vietnam. To me, it's really about public sectors versus private sectors. Uh, yeah. Right. Thank you, um, Julian. Uh, I wanted to, to, to add to that where you, uh, there's a payment, for example, that's something that's very intimately related to variations, yeah, amongst other things. Yeah. In many other jurisdictions that I've um, had dealings with, um, there are security of payment legislation. For example, Singapore, there's a security of payment act jurisdictions that typically uh, um, uh, uh, have them in Australia, there are many secure payments. The UK with the Construction Act in 1996 introduced security of payments, you know, and, and so on. Uh, will we, I think Hong Kong is very timidly trying or starting to introduce security of payments in Hong Kong, at least to Hong Kong anyway, I don't know about the mainland China. Will we see, or is there any moves in Vietnam or to introduce security of payment legislation in, in Vietnam, similar to those other jurisdictions, do you think? So to me, like, I don't have the answer to your question directly. However, um, securing the payment or securing the uh, enforcement of your entertainments to me is linked as well with the governing law and as well with the dispute resolution mechanisms. And I know that we have some friends from Vayak just in front of us. So I would like to congratulate them. I think that Vietnam has, is coming from a position that had, a, and I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen, terrible reputation in terms of enforcing international arbitrations. And they have made an amazing, tremendous effort to change this. 
it's going to be a very long effort because the, the mentalities will take time to change. And that's the reason why it's not only by eh? Malaysia was the same for different uh, Vietnam, Malaysia, uh, the, the same for different reasons. And that's the reason why in the area, everyone wants to go to Singapore. But I do believe that Vietnam is doing an excellent job uh, in uh, improving the trust of the partners in the uh, dispute resolution mechanisms, and in particular in the international arbitration. And uh, additionally, I, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think Vietnam is also party to the New York, New York Convention, which is... Absolutely. But that was one of the things, is despite the fact that they were part of it, like you go back to at the beginning, there were lots of decisions, unfortunately, where the enforcement was not as easy as some other country like the UK, for example, or Singapore. But this has really changed. You can see uh, uh, some uh, some data now because uh, some decisions are available. And you will see that uh, the number of decisions uh, refusing the enforcement of an international order award um, have reduced uh, significantly. Right. Yeah, well, moving in the right direction. Chris, would you like to add anything to uh, that? OK, yeah. Fol following up on, the, on, on what Zurian uh, mentioned, the, uh, because of the, the difficulty of enforcement of the foreign arbitrary, arbitral award in Vietnam. So the, uh, the many times I, the, I, I used to give the, uh, my clients the options to uh, designate the VA as the, uh, the dispute resolution uh, body. Uh, because the, if if the employer uh, the is in, uh, I mean, if, if my client is the contractor and the employer is in Vietnam, then you know I the the strongly recommend them to think about the uh, designating VA uh, because the because of you know is is more the way way much easier uh, to get the uh, the. To go through the enforcement in Vietnam, the, if the, they get the award uh, from VA, then the other, you know, the, e, e, even if they, they they get the in 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 the worst case, I it took uh two and a, two and a half years to uh get an approval of the enforcement of the foreign arbitral award in Vietnam. The worst case, I think. Worst case, I mean that's a it's a long time. Okay, um, we've got. Um... A couple of minutes, uh, and I did promise Miss Tao over there that I would finish on time. So, a couple of minutes um, for another question, please. Ah, there's a, there's one raised hand here. Ah, look, Mr. Jung, right at the back there, over there. Hello, everybody. First of all, thank JC and all speaker to share your point of view relating to Vietnamese law compared with the international law. Uh, May I say my thought, not question, not Q&A. Uh, Go ahead. The, yeah, this is my, my thought. Uh, compared with the 20 years ago, the Vietnamese law are going opposed the international requirement come from the FIDIC, ADB, and World Bank. And I hope in the near future, the Vietnamese law are go closely. It, it means that the gap between Vietnamese law and the international requirement shall become zero. And hope in the near future, the dream come true because this is one of the most major thing to attract foreigners to come to Vietnam. This is my thought. Thank you. And I have a, a small requirement to Mr. Chung. Uh, Mr. Chung, please, in the, uh, when you open uh, the next workshop, can you add the one topic? The gap between Vietnamese law and international law. How to close the gap between the Vietnamese law and international law? This is my thought. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Jung. Excellent. Um, and I think um, unless there are any other pressing questions, we could probably squeeze one more in, but as long as it's a quick one. If not, um, I draw this session to a... Ah, yes, yes, we have a hand over there uh, in the corner next to the, uh, the column. Uh, and this will be the final question. And then I'll close, uh, close the proceedings. Yes, uh, thank you for uh, your sharing... Uh... Uh, recently, I have uh, one question for Mr. Christopher. Um, regarding to the uh, the slide difficulty to uh, be paid in case of variation, uh, I have uh, experience that uh, the uh, the contractor and the engineer, uh, the employer enter the FIDIC contract, and 
the the employer uh, have uh, uh, an instruction uh, cause uh, a variation um, because the for following physical uh, no upfront of agreement on the cost when uh, the contractor uh, uh, doing the uh, the variation and uh, at the end of the the project um, um, a variation uh, cost uh, I uh, for example uh, one billion uh, US dollar um, however um, the uh, QS consultant um, assess uh, the amount uh, about uh, uh, zero point eight billion. However, the employer uh, said that I uh, my pocket was only have uh, uh, zero point five billion only. And so, um, what should the contractor do uh, in this case? I, I'm trying to uh, summarize the the question there. It was quite long, so. Uh, I, I, well, I, I will try, but the, I, I, I don't remember the numbers. Obviously, that's something they didn't register. But the, but I think the question is something to do with uh, the ability of the employer to pay for variations that have been instructed. Is that would that be a summary, or am I completely wrong? Can well, you just summarize the question? Um, I would like to ask that uh, in case the employer don't have enough money to pay for that variation. Ah. What oh. could the contractor do? Perfect, perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So the employer's yeah. abilities. Yeah. Well, uh, bring the contract. Uh, okay. Be... So if I understand correctly, uh, the employer wants a variation, instruct the engineer to instruct the contractor to make a variation, but has no money to pay the variation. Right. Um, maybe. Um, there is a provision under FIDIC contract um, um, according to which at any moment you can ask the uh, employer if he has any uh, enough money to implement the contract to pay. Uh, and the employer has to reply and to establish and to show you with uh, some proof that he has enough money to do so. So maybe, I'm not sure about it, but under FIDIC contract, I will try to, to, to uh, apply this, this provision. And otherwise, if he has no money, I mean, why would you ask variation? Right. I think that's pretty clear, Crystal. Okay. Yes. Uh, yeah. Sorry. And then I suppose if as if you're the contractor and your employer doesn't have any cash to uh, pay for the variation uh, before starting an arbitration that's going to cost you even more, be sure that to have identified before starting any procedure any assets from your from the employer probably not in the country where you are but somewhere else where is located or where hq is located to make sure and check whether or not in that country your arbitration award will be enforced so you'll be able to to be paid it's going to be very long and painful but at least you'll be paid right thank you very much for those insights and uh time has run out i'm afraid I know, you know, you would like to continue for the rest of the afternoon, but we do have another panel and uh, I will hand over to them. So thank you very much to this absolutely fantastic panel and to your participation.